All right, welcome back everybody. Ask the Collective 14. My name is Rich Brubaker. I'm the founder of Collective Responsibility. And today I answer two questions from students worried about the future of automation and their career prospects. We hope you'll enjoy it. And if you do, please remember, like, share, and comment. Yang Yanan asks, what AI can do is beyond our imagination. Do you think AI will take away more jobs from people and which industry will face a more severe challenge from AI? Yanan, thank you very much for your question. Um, it's a very good one and it's one that actually, if you look back in our other episodes, we've touched on a few times. So first off, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context and I'm gonna ask you the question. So big context, AI, it's gonna steal all the jobs of the future, right? That's what we're being told. Or if you read up on some of the um, recent research out of Oxford, there's some from Deloitte, from, from some other areas, which I'll link down below. They're basically saying up to about 70, 80% of jobs over the next 10 to 20 years are at risk of some level of automation, um, be it through robotics, AI, or other technologies. Now, some level could be just a little bit to help you get through your day to ending your career path pretty quickly. And for me, there's some industries that we have looked at that I think were quite interesting. And there's the ones who I think that are really most interesting at the end of the day. The ones we looked at last year for the United Nations International Labor Organization, part of our future of work research, is we looked at textiles and electronics manufacturing. Their question was very simple. What will the role of automation be in the factories? How many jobs will it displace? What are going to be the trends that follow through there? Now, what we found very interestingly is one of the big barriers, there's a couple of big barriers, you know, like capital costs, um, functionality. Can the robots actually do your job yet? Like the dexterity of their hands, not necessarily there, but also, you know, on the line itself, just because you have robots doesn't mean you don't need people. The people who are needed to set up the robotics, to maintain the robotics, to manage the process, actually don't exist right now. So the good thing, one of the big barriers is the fact that we don't have the human capacity to run the robots on our factory floors yet. But the biggest one that I took away from this was that the reality is labor against robots for a long time coming is gonna be very cheap. And in a world where most of the manufacturing bases, be it China, Southeast Asia, Africa, you know, parts of the United States, uh, Europe, the political, the political environment being as unstable as it is, the economic environment being unstable as it is, the questions about climate change creating environmental, um, environmental stability issues. Many firms right now do not want to put in 20, 30, 100 million dollars worth of robots into one space because you know what? They can't move them. And so this is actually the biggest barrier that we took away from if you're worried about the manufacturing space on any level. So that's one area. But through this research, actually, we started to look at what are the other areas? And the ones that I came away with that are probably the most concerning, if I were in these industries, would be anyone who's driving anything. So automated cars means automated taxis, means automated trucks, means automated airplanes, means automated cruise ships, means automated container ships. So if your main job right now or your future job the future like what you want to do in life involves you going like this all day long you're probably in trouble the other areas that i thought were really interesting is if you look at the business services accounting law banking there's already stories of how investment banks or accounting firms are investing in a little bit of software a little bit of machine learning and all of a sudden they're wiping out a hundred jobs a thousand jobs now i've talked to people in this area and I've asked them, how do you become a Goldman Sachs partner, investment banker, without having gone through these lower areas of learning how to be an analyst, learning how to assess deals, learning how to negotiate? Like, how do you do that path? How do you learn that path? And the, basically what their feedback was, was we're gonna move to real pure data analysts where your job's gonna be to, to actually understand how to create the algorithm, You'll have to understand all the basics of finance, accounting, legal, whatever it may be, but you're gonna apply it very differently. You're not gonna be talking to clients every single day about how to fill out this paperwork and what the best structure will be. You'll just create the algorithms and so you have to know all that in advance. Which leads me to my question for you. You've asked this question, you're already a little bit obviously aware, perhaps concerned about what AI may do in the future to jobs. 
And that's probably because you're worried about your own pr prospects, your own job, because you're a student right now. So what does it mean for you as a student who's leaving university and your future career? My question to you is, you have this concern, you know it's coming, what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna take the first job that pays a few bills that you know will be automated? You shouldn't. You should look at this as a maze, maybe something like when you're a kid, when you're going through the different lines, you're like, oh, I hit the wall, oh, I hit the wall, there's the pass. You need to look at automation not as a game-ending event, but as a maze that you individually, you as a cohort, you as a company, need to start finding where there are walls and where there are exit points. And you need to start plotting now for what those exit points may be. So if you're going to banking, law, any of those, you should definitely be learning computer science. You should be definitely taking every computer code class that you can think of that may apply in any way to finance, legal, accounting, whatever it may be. If you want to be a, a taxi driver, you better learn what the next thing is for you because that's maybe got 10, 15 years left on it in most major economies. So my question to you and my question to anyone watching this is, you know this is gonna happen, what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna sit back, do your job, sit back, study for your gal cow, sit back, study for whatever you have to, to accomplish today's objective? Or are you gonna start thinking out three, five, 20 years in the future and start learning the skills that you need? Because the reality is all those skills are already available. If you do a little bit of research on jobs of the future, automation and finance, you know, robotics and manufacturing, they will start talking about where these things are entering, what their trajectory is, and then what that means for the, the general industry. What you need to do is go, I wanna be ahead of that curve. I wanna be above the waterline. And you need to start taking action now. So I hope this has answered your question, but more than anything, I really hope that you ask yourself the question I just asked you. You know this is coming, what are you going to do about it? Because that's really all that matters at the end of the day. Thank you very much for your question. A student asks, I heard that only the most technical and creative work will not be replaced by AI in the future. What is your opinion on this issue? Also, do you think innovation and creativity can be trained? Any blogs or books to recommend? Okay, so that's a lot of questions and quite, quite complicated. First off, what's my opinion on technical creative work being safe? Um, my general thought is anyone who views himself as safe is probably the first one to be eaten alive by nature. Um, Darwin rules all the time. And so I really believe that while the creative, like we, like we really like to think that we're special and to date we are, but we're already, they're already showing that, you know, algorithms can write Pulitzer Prize winning novels, uh, that they can create movies and then create all kinds of human emotion, even if it's a little bit off, you know, you give it five, 10, 20 years, we should not think that we're safe. I do believe that it's safer than if it were a taxi driver or, you know, to get back to our last question, I think it's safer than if you are a low level business analyst working in the credit department of your local bank. I do think it's safer than if you were, you know, on any manufacturing line over the next 25 years, but I don't believe that it's safe. I do believe that innovators and innovation will start to leverage you know the human innovators the human creators will start to leverage the better that they are at leveraging technology the safer they will become because i think more and more the more that we understand technology the more we understand where it's going to go the more we can think about how humans interact with it the better we are at creating creative content or logos or whatever it may be you just have to understand the basic principles of technology and innovation and even automation on some level. You have to know what your computer can do for you and what it can't. Like I know that 10 years ago, Adobe Premiere or you know, the, the, file, the system that I was using to cut videos was pretty basic. It was like you have the clip, you cut, you cut, and maybe you can do some brightness. Um, in our last videos, we were changing everything, the direction of the light, we are changing how far you can come in and it will remove the pixelation. It, technology can do so much. But if you don't respect it and you don't know how to use it because you think that you're safe, you're gonna be losing your job to another human being who has kept up. So the race you may think is with AI, but it may actually be with the other human beings around you who are in your graduating class, your first company, your startup, whatever it may be who want to actually go farther, who understand where the trend line is going and they're putting themselves in that place. So 
you're never safe. And I think this is something that my generation, 70s and 80s, has to get used to. But the 90s and after, it's just gonna be a part of who you are. Like if you ever feel safe, and if you ever think in this economic, environmental, societal upheaval, that there's some reason for you to be safe, you're just not paying attention to the most important things. So pay attention, see where the things are going in your industry, be it technology, automation, whatever it may be, and figure out what you need to learn to put yourself ahead of the curve. Now to your other questions. I'm gonna do that again. Okay. To your other question about whether or not uh, innovation and creativity can be trained. You know, I, there's, a, there's a lot of debate on this. And I'll just say from my personal experience, uh, when I opened up one of my first companies, I co-shared with a design firm who was focused on, or who specialized in mobile phone design. And through two years of being in that environment and seeing what their team was doing, I won't say that I got trained in being more innovative or more creative. I think on some level I already was innovative and creative, but what they showed me was how they go through that process. They provided a framework and a structure that I could actually literally see on the wall as these mobile phones were taking shape, as the first apps they were developing were taking shape. I learned about their process, I learned about how they worked as a team, I learned about how they delegate, I learned about UI and UX, things that I never knew anything about. And I'm a business economics major. so. I think on some level, yes, you can learn the frameworks, you can learn the terminology, and you can probably learn how to get an idea from zero to 50, zero to 80% complete. But I, only a few people, and I, I don't know of any offhand that I could name, they could be purely execution and creative at 100%. They would have to surround themselves with the, both, with the best teams. And so in that sense, if you are a business person who is not technically creative, who doesn't know the tools of Premiere, Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, that's okay. As long as you can facilitate those who can, that's fine as well. So having respect for the creative, I think is very important, even if you're not creative. But to have a real respect, I think you have to have somewhat of a creative bone in you, or at least a framework around you. All right, so for the second half of your question about books and blogs uh, related to innovation and creativity. First off, you need to separate. One is, are you looking for tools, tips, and tricks that are very practical, very, you know, it's things I can learn today that I can put into practice tomorrow. So, how to use Adobe Illustrator, how to improve my SEO, how to X. If you're looking for that, go to any of the major tech platforms that you're using online. It could be Baidu, Google, Facebook, you know, Yoku, Tudo, YouTube, whatever it may be and just go and spend a day in that. And actually, you know, this is what I will do personally if I'm trying to figure out like, how do I improve X? I'll go to YouTube usually, and I'll type in how do I improve X? There'd be 15 individuals who are standing in front of a camera just like I am answering this same question, and I just take notes. Normally, 80% of it's the same, 20% variety, and I just try and pick out what are the things that I can personally do, what are the things that I understand, what are the things I can execute on right away. And they'll be like, that's enough for today. I'll come back in three weeks and I'll learn the three more things that I need. So that's one way of doing it. And there's thousands of books, blogs, websites, videos that you can leverage on anything tactical that you want to know. If your question was more focused on the vision, like where is technology going? How does technology come into industry? What should I as a young person know about whatever? This gets a little bit more challenging because this requires that you create a set of filters that you learn to trust. And I don't mean trust as in I agree with it. I mean trust as in there are experts, there are practitioners, there are organizations who are bringing different knowledge from their viewpoint into this pool of information that you wanna look at. So what I will do and I have no standard when it comes to blog or books or whatever. like if I see something and it looks like it comes from someone I should trust, I will actually go and figure out who that person is or I'll figure out where that organization's from. And so this is kind of like my first filter. Is it credible? Does it come from a person from outside the industry? So it's not a McDonald's PR person talking. It's not a Tesla, you know, it's not Elon Musk talking. It's not Richard Branson talking. It's actually the people that they pay to come speak at their organizations about what they are worried about. So the real experts, and I'll go find their blogs, their YouTube channels, their Facebook, their LinkedIn. I'll go find out everything I can 
I'll bring them all into my feed and I'll just constantly look through this. The second thing is I really look for depth of content. If you're on social, you know, whether it be WeChat, Facebook, whatever, whatever the, the medium is for you, that it's very easy to see a title that goes, ooh, I'll click on that. But what you should really be looking for is when you open up an article, is there real depth? Is it more than 250 words and a couple pictures and maybe a time lapse of New York City? Is there hyperlinked articles? Are they actually doing depth of work to bring in different perspectives to say, I agree with this, I don't agree with this, I'm not sure about this, but at the end of the day, this is what I believe. And those are the articles that I really enjoy because regardless of whether I do or do not agree with them, or I do or do not agree with their framework, they give me so many resources to keep going and looking, and I'll find the people I need to over time. Another kind of hack is to go find, type in, you know, future of work, file type colon PPT into Google or into Baidu. And that will throw out the, the most recent presentations that were delivered at a lot of public events. Go find out who are giving those presentations, then go find out what they're saying separately. Um, and so at the end of the day, there, it really depends on what you wanna learn and how active you wanna spend on this. I can spend entire days on just learning search engine optimization or color correction in Photoshop or you know how aquaculture solves a food, water, energy nexus problem. And that's the approach that you should take. When you're doing that, you'll start to create your own filters, you'll start to find your own things, and that's what you really want. Just keep staying curious at the end of the day and keep learning along the way. If the materials that you find are boring, if they don't help you move your boat forward, cut them. If they do, keep following them, ask them questions, reach out. And through that process, over time, over a period of years, you won't learn anything right now, over a period of years, you'll become really comfortable with the knowledge, really comfortable with the information, really comfortable knowing who it is that you can go and ask a really smart question to when you need a really smart answer for whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. So thank you very much for your question. Have a great week.